Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome again to Hillside. Uh, Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6? We're going to be in verses, or actually just verse 15 today. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. Um, And as you're going there, before we jump into Ephesians 6, verse 15, I just want us to remember two things that we actually began studying a couple of weeks ago. We've been in the book of Ephesians now this entire school year, but we began studying the last section of Ephesians a couple of weeks ago. And the first thing that I would love for us to remember is this, as Christians, we're in a spiritual battle. I think it's important that we start there with that baseline that at Christian, as Christians, we're at war. Uh, we have an enemy, the Bible tells us. Um, verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6 says it like this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So the first thing that we have to understand is that we are in a spiritual war, and our battle is against the evil one. And our call as believers in the midst of all of that is to stand in the midst of the battle. Well, how? How do we stand? If we're in a battle, if we're at a war, if it's with Satan, how do we stand? Well, last week we began to look at the armor that has been given to us by God in order that we might be able to stand firm against the devil's schemes. Maybe you're asking this question, okay, well, why is the devil against us. Here's why. Maybe you've never asked that question, but here is the answer to that question. The same grace that in Christ reconciles us to God, that same grace is what antagonizes us to the evil one. And so the Christian, the person that has put their faith in Christ, the person who is in Christ, is therefore engaged in a continual an irreconcilable war because the enemy wants to kill and steal and destroy. He's at war with God. You are in Christ. Therefore, he is at war with you. And that's important for us to remember. Why? Is it so that we are terrified in this life? No. It's important for us to remember so that we will live in reality as we walk here on this earth. The second thing that I want us to remember today, the first one is that we're at war. The second thing, as we get started, is really the best news in all of this. Because you could hear that and say, holy cow, no thank you. But the best news in all of this is the reality of the gospel. And that is something that we ended with last week. But I want us always to remember that this. And that is this, the gospel is not self-help. And so this is really important for us always to remember as we study this armor, the armor of God, the war that we are in, which is a reality, it has been won by Christ on the cross. And so putting on the full armor of God so that we might be able to stand, it's not a call for us to go buy some armor so that we can stand. It isn't a call for us to make up our own armor. It is not a call to arm ourselves. It is a call to stand in the divine armament of God. The call to put on the full armor of God is a call to stand in the reality of the gospel. We have to remind ourselves of that. As I thought about this uh, during the week this week, it brought to mind for me the story of David and Goliath. Maybe you guys are familiar with that story. I would guess probably most of us are familiar with that story. But there was likely... No one who ever faced a more daunting human opponent than David did when he faced Goliath. What we know about Goliath is that he was over nine feet tall. Most people think nine and a half feet, nine feet six inches. So imagine that if you can. I doubt if any of you have ever met a human who was nine feet six inches. But, and if Goliath was as well proportioned as, say, an NBA basketball player, like someone I know some of you guys hate this guy, but like LeBron James, who is six feet, eight inches tall and 250 pounds, that's pretty well proportioned. You would say he is a physically fit human. If Goliath was anything like that at nine feet, six inches tall, then he would have been at least 400 pounds. And so nine and a half feet and 400 pounds, imagine that. And according to 1 Samuel chapter 17, Goliath's torso was fitted with, this is 1 Samuel 17 verse 5, a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, which would have been 
125 pounds of armor on this man. Also, from 1 Samuel, we know that Goliath's spear was like a weaver's beam, which means it was 14 feet long, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels, which would have been around 15 pounds, almost the weight of a men's college shot put. So, pretty heavy spear. The entirety of the spear was probably around 30 pounds. So, imagine the side of this man, nine and a half feet, 400 pounds, likely, With all of this armor, how could anyone approach this kind of giant in a battle? What our conventional wisdom would tell us is that we should approach Goliath with Goliath-like equipment, right? That's what Saul thought anyway. Maybe you'll remember, but Saul gave David his armor to put on, and David tried on this king's oversized armor. Look at Well, it'll be on the screen. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 and 39. They tell us this. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And then it says this. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. We all know the rest of the story. Likely, David depended on the Lord for victory, and he triumphed over Goliath and the Philistine army. But the question has to be this. Why was David able to defeat Goliath without matching Goliath's armor? How did this little guy defeat a nine-foot giant? Was it just dumb luck? No. No. David set aside conventional armament, and he chose the dress and the weaponry that was suitable for battling his unique foe. And I really don't want us to miss this as we jump into the armor of God again today. The story of David and Goliath is not a story about David being some great warrior. It really isn't. It's the story of God's power over his enemy. It's the story of God's power when people trust God. It's about the greatness and the power of God. The story of David and Goliath, it's so relevant to us as we fight a spiritual war. Why? Because the spiritual battle that we fight is against an enemy whose troops are far more capable and far more lethal than the Philistine giant. That's a struggle. And again, I, I don't say this to scare us, but so that we understand that more than ever, in order for us to stand against the evil one, which is what we've been called to do in this Christian life, then we have to reject self-reliance and conventional methods. And the way to do that is for us to daily flee to God. The gospel is not self-help. And to daily flee to his armory for our instruction and for our outfitting. And so last week we began to see that this armor that we put on against our formidable enemy is that we need to put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. And now today, Paul continues to challenge us to put on divine arm, the divine armor of God by saying this in verse 15, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Paul says, put on the gospel shoes today. Now, I would imagine that every one of us, I saw most of you walk in this morning, are wearing shoes. Um, And as silly as that probably sounds to anybody, shoes are a very important thing. I did a tiny bit of research this week, and I discovered that in 2023, the U.S. shoe market generated $88.5 billion in revenue. And I think half of that was um, in my house. And by... (laughs) By 2028, it's forecasted that the market value of shoes in the U.S. is projected to reach $104 billion. In one study I found, it indicated that American women possess 27 pairs of shoes on average, which incidentally is 125% more compared to the number of pairs of shoes men usually own. But you guys make up for it with golf clubs and guns and stuff like that. So... 
If you and I were to walk into a shoe store today, we would probably see everything from Crocs, a personal favorite of mine, to boots, but not all the same kinds of boots. You have dress boots, you have cowboy boots, you have work boots, you have snow boots, and then you would find hiking shoes or biking shoes, and you would find tennis shoes and basketball shoes and running shoes, and some of the running shoes are for the trails, and then others of them are for the street, and some are for races, and then others are just for your training. And some of us would find baseball cleats and we would find football cleats and soccer cleats and sandals and flip-flops and you would find Uggs and then you would find fake Uggs and you would find... <laughs> I'm, I've just learned all of this. And then I was really surprised this year when Carson started running track at how many different kinds of running spikes there are. There's middle distance and uh, other distances. <laughs> just all these different things. And I was like, what for a shoe that's like this thin, you have to pay that much money. That's insane. And my girls dance and you would be shocked to know how many dancing shoes there are. But the point is this, the message that is conveyed to us when we go into any place with shoes is that shoes are really important. And the kind of shoe that you use is really important to the activity that you are using it for. Now, while I think that our modern-day shoe infatuation is probably a little bit extreme, personally, I also think that it's realistic to say this, the kind of shoe that you wear, it can and does make a major difference in what you're doing. For example, just so we're all on the same page, wearing a tap shoe to go hiking in the Black Hills would be silly. You wouldn't be able to walk. And after you did walk, you wouldn't be able to walk for a week after that. <laughs> the kind of shoe you wear does matter. And so today, in verse 15, Paul is drawing our attention to the fact that the shoe that you and I are to wear in this armor of God, it will greatly determine your ability to stand firm. The image that Paul has in mind comes from the Roman soldier's war boot. It's called a caliga. I actually didn't draw this picture. I was going to say that, which would have been a lie. There's a picture on the screen. It's the half boot that a Roman soldier regularly wore while he was on duty. It was an open-toed boot with a heavily nailed studded sole that was tied to the ankles and the shins with straps. Josephus, who is an ancient Jewish historian, writes about how a large part of the success of Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar were due to their armies, at least in part, being equipped with footwear that made them able to undertake long marches at incredible speed over rough terrain. So this boot of the Roman soldier gave them foot traction and prevented them from sliding. A large part of an ancient battle would have been hand-to-hand -hand or foot-to-foot -foot combat. Probably a good way for us maybe to think about it in our modern context, although I'm probably going to lose at least half of us, would be the line of scrimmage in a football game. The goal at the line of, the, of scrimmage would be to not give up ground to your opponent. And so these boots of the Roman soldier gave him an amazing advantage over ill-equipped foes to hold his ground and then to also advance. And today what Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus and to you and I is that for the believer, the gospel of peace, the peace that comes to us through the gospel is what makes us immovable in battle and what gives us our ability to mobilize. And so Paul says, put on these gospel shoes. Now, I know that a phrase like put on gospel shoes sounds weird. So let's answer this question today. What is it that these gospel shoes provide for us? And then how do we put them on? I'm going to answer that question with three things that the gospel shoes provide for us this morning, starting with the first one, and that is that gospel shoes provide stability or immovability. Remember that the subject of this call from Paul to be ready with the gospel is in the context of us standing. How do we know that? Well, let's just look backward for a minute in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 says this, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? To stand. And then in verse 13, he says, stand firm. And then in verse 14, he says, stand, therefore. 
And so Paul is saying, stand firm, be stable, be immovable. The question then has to be for us, what gives us our ability to stand firm? And his answer to what gives us our ability to stand and provide sure footing for us is found in verse 15. Let me read the verse for us again. As shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So Paul is saying this, our sure foundation, our sure footing is the gospel. It is the gospel of peace. Okay, well, what is the gospel of peace? Let me break it down for us into two things. First, the gospel of peace is peace with God. In order to stand firm in the good news of the gospel, we have to accept the bad news about our sin. The Bible confronts and indicts us all, all with this plain truth. Romans chapter 3, 23, it says this, and probably many of you know it, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Paul goes on in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, and he says that the wages of our sin is death. And as hard as it is for us to hear this about ourselves, we don't love this, is that if we take sin and judgment out of the gospel in order to make this message more acceptable to our modern thinking, then what we do is we take away our need for a Savior. It's important for us to know that Christ did not die to save us from our poor self-esteem. He didn't die to save us from financial ruin or fill in the blank. Christ died to save us from sin and the deserved judgment of God. Christ died so that you and I can have peace with God. And so when we repent of our sin and believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord, then the good news is that we have received peace with God. This is the gospel of peace. We are given peace with God through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says it like this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we've placed our faith in Christ, we have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Life apart from Christ has no deep peace. And, and the reality is this, in order to find peace, our world often pursues it with passive desperation, right? I mean, we try to find hope in money or in relationships or in knowledge or in religious exploration, but lasting peace seems like an ever-receding mirage. But when a person finds peace with God through Christ, it is inexpressibly wonderful. Knowing that your sins are forgiven and forgotten through Christ is the grandest knowledge to have. The solid awareness that you are reconciled to God is joyfully sublime. This is an aside, and I don't know how any of you feel about this, but I just saw a YouTube video the other day with Russell Brand. And maybe you know who he is, but he came to faith like a month ago and was baptized. The man's face looks different. He has experienced the peace of God. There's no other explanation. And the point is this. When our feet are outfitted and planted in this gospel of peace with God, then we stand firm against the greatest assaults of the enemy. When we have peace with God through Christ, we stand on solid ground, the solid ground of salvation bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. So the gospel of peace is peace with God, but also the gospel of peace is the peace of God. In the upper room on the final night of Jesus's earthly life, Jesus told his disciples and certainly all of the people who would follow him, so you and I, he said, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. And we need to understand this, that when we stand on the solid, the sure foundation of the gospel, when we place our faith in Christ, he gives us his personal peace. That's amazing. You might be asking, okay, well, what does that look like? Well, it's the peace that Jesus knew when he lay fast asleep in the boat amidst a storming sea. It's the same peace that Jesus had that so unnerved the fearful Pilate as he interrogated Jesus. 
It's from above, and so it rises above the difficulties that are all around it because the person that has the peace of God just believes that God is good and he's in control. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want us to really understand this today. The gospel is what provides a super surpassing peace with God and the peace of God. When Paul writes his great chapter on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he actually begins in verse 1 with this. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand. Do you see that? There's that word again, stand. The gospel of peace is what gives us incredible and sure footing, peace with God and the peace of God. The reason that the Roman soldier's shoes were so important to the soldier was it prevented them from slipping and falling. A Roman soldier couldn't do his job if he was running around in his slippers or in his cross. And the same is true for us in our spiritual battle. One of the greatest evidences of somebody who's wearing gospel shoes is that they can stand firm. So when Satan attacks with the flaming missiles of doubt, such as, if God really loved you, he wouldn't have let this happen to you. What we do is we dig our gospel shoes into the turf of God's word and we reply, it is written, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Or when Satan stabs you from behind with, remember what you did, we dig in more deeply and we reply, it is written, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Gospel shoes provide gospel peace, which makes us stable. Gospel shoes provide stability. And then the second thing I want us to see today is that gospel shoes provide mobility. It's important for us to know that putting on gospel shoes involves both the stability that allows us to stand firm against the evil one, but also I think equally as important is that our gospel shoes give us the mobility to share the reality of our peace with the world around us. And so the Roman soldier was issued shoes not only to dig in, but also to travel great distances. He was issued shoes to cover ground in short time and to go into very hard places, and this has to be true of God's people too. Gospel shoes take the gospel out to our lost world and even into hard places. So when we put on the sure grounding of the gospel of peace with God and the gospel of peace of God, then that provides for us a foundation to go out and mobilize. Okay, well, what does it look like to be mobilized by the gospel of peace. What it looks like for us is announcing the gospel of peace. It looks like what Christ came to do. Look at Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Isaiah says this, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the herald who proclaims peace, who brings news of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul told us that through the blood of Christ, we are brought near to God. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says of Jesus, he is our peace. And then in verse 17, Paul says this of Jesus, and he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. So Jesus was the ultimate one with the beautiful feet who came with his gospel shoes, announced the peace to the Jews and the Gentiles. And those of us who know Christ have his peace. And now we have the same mission. We are called to bring this message of peace to our world. As I was preparing this week, 1 Peter chapter 3 came to mind for me as I considered well, what does it look like for us to announce the gospel of peace to the world that we live in? Look with me at what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. He says this, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So in other words, the thoughts 
in the mind of Peter is that when people are going to inquire about the gospel of peace in your life, they are very likely going to inquire about the hope that you have because of the peace that you have. How is this going to happen? Is it going to be some kind of lecture hall that you invite a lot of people to? I don't think so. How will this happen? What does this look like? Well, I think people are going to see that you are filled with hope in a gloomy world. Or they're going to see that you have faced or you are facing very real sadness in your life with hope and peace. Or they're going to see that you have lost a loved one, maybe, or you've lost a job, or you still have this inexplicable peace from God as a result And as a result, you have hope in the midst of really hard things. Or people are going to be in your home, and they're going to see your marriage, and that it honors God, or they're going to see your children and the way that you parent your kids, or they're going to see the way that you interact with your boss, and they're going to see your hope and your peace. And in those moments, I guarantee you that people are never going to say to you, tell me about how religious you are. They're going to say, I want to know, how is it that you have this kind of hope and this kind of peace within you? How can you have hope even when your life doesn't seem perfect? What is it all about? I need an explanation. And it's in those moments when we are equipped with the shoes of the gospel of peace that we will be given the opportunity to share our reason for the hope that we have within us. This is how gospel shoes provide mobility for us. When we're standing on the firm foundation of peace with God and the peace of God, then we will have opportunities to proclaim the gospel of peace to our world, the reason for our hope. So gospel shoes provide for us stability. Gospel shoes provide for us mobility, or you could say that they demand mobility. And then I think that probably a sub-point to gospel shoes demand mobility is something I'm actually going to just make a point, and I hope that you don't hate me for this, but gospel shoes call for adaptability. This one I've had a little bit harder time with this week, sort of processing, and so if at the end you're very confused, just forgive me, okay? I'm human too. But the shoes of a Roman soldier would have given him the ability to turn on a dime. Gospel shoes provide for us the ability to be adaptable or flexible. Now before I share with you what I mean by that, let me just say first what I am definitely not saying. Clearly, I do not mean that we need to adapt our message or modify the message of the gospel to suit the tastes of our culture. I do not mean that at all. We will always remain convinced as a church that the regular teaching of the Bible is our calling. We we want to see men and women and boys and girls encounter the living God through his living word. That, that is set in stone. God's word does God's work by God's spirit in the lives of those who encounter it. That, that is the drumbeat. That's our rudder. But with those convictions held tightly to the convictions of God's word, what the gospel is, I think there needs to be adaptability. And this is where I am really struggled with this this week. So Let me be as gentle as I can, because I I don't think it's mean, and I don't ever want to use the pulpit to, to berate any of us, ever. But here's what I mean. I mean that if our real concern is for the gospel, it's for the gospel of peace, if it is so that we will mobilize and share the peace of God with people, so that we will push back darkness, so that we will stand firm, then I think we need to be prepared sometimes to let go of our personal preferences, sometimes. An example of this would be this, and this is just an example. If we desire to reach young people in the city of Vermilion with the gospel, then sometimes it's possible that our worship songs might not be what we prefer. Myself included, Julianne and I were listening to 90s worship yesterday in the house, so I'm getting old myself. But why does this matter? Because 
we, we, do we want to torture each other? No, not at all. Because we want people to know and experience the peace with God and the peace of God that we have. Or another example would be this, and this one is one of many, I think, but if we want to reach our community with the gospel of peace, then we might have to be okay with expanding our current building or building a different one. Why? Because we like shiny things? Not at all. Not at all. Because we want so badly for the world to know and experience the life-changing love of Jesus Christ that is the gospel. Because we want peace to reign in our community. And in that sense, and in probably many, many more senses, gospel shoes call for adaptability. Because the gospel matters. Worship team, would you come on up? I think that we probably see the functionality of gospel shoes, likely. They provide stability, they provide mobility, and they even call for adaptability. And so as we finish up this morning, what we need to see is we need to ask this question. And it's a question that we always ask, and that is, what does this mean for me? Well, let me just leave us with one thing this morning. As I was Working on this message this week, I just kept thinking, how do I put these shoes on? How do I, how do I put on the gospel shoes? And the simple answer was this. We put on the gospel of peace when we rehearse the gospel. Understand this with me today. Peace is not the basis of our confidence. Our confidence in God is the basis for our biblical peace. And the only way for me to continually have confidence in God and the subsequent peace is for me to always remember or always remind myself of or always rehearse the reality of the gospel. Peace comes from God and God alone. Peace comes through Jesus Christ, who made peace between men and God and between men at enmity with one another. And he did all of this on the cross. And it is God alone through Christ that gives inner peace that enables us to stand even in the midst of Satan's schemes. Our peace is a result of us daily trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins and for his righteousness, which enables us to have fellowship with God. Something I was thinking about this morning, and it's always dangerous when I try to add to my sermon the morning of, but I was thinking early this morning, actually when I was putting my shoes on, that little kids often need help putting their shoes on, don't they? In fact, Hopefully Carson will forgive me for this. We were running the other day and we went down the hill and had to come back up the bluff and we were so, but she was fine. I was gassed. I, and she said, my shoe came untied. Dad, will you help me tie my shoe? And I said, Carson, if I bend over, I'm never getting back up. <laughs> so, so no. But oftentimes we need help, especially in moments when times are difficult. And so rehearsing the gospel of peace also means helping each other rehearse the gospel of peace. Helping each other put those shoes on. The enemy is attacking. What do we tell each other? We remind each other about the truth of the gospel of peace. I'm at peace with God and I have the peace of God. And here is why it is because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Tell each other that. Tell your children that. Help them put the shoes on. Tell your Friends that shoes are untied, here's how we do it. We put on the gospel of peace like this. We rehearse the gospel and put on the gospel of peace when we delight in the work that God has done through his son on the cross. When we remind ourselves that he is our salvation and he is our security and he is our victory. He is our joy. The shoes of the gospel of peace are ours to put on when we rejoice and rest in him and his finished work on the cross. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you again for your word. God, thank you so much 
that the requirement is not that we figure out how to stand on solid ground. It's that we stand on the solid ground of the gospel. Lord, this morning I pray that as we receive communion together, that we would just be able to continually rehearse the reality of the gospel. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.